This week on the Backtable Podcast. I came across this really interesting survey that they did out of Minnesota, um, as Kennedy's group, I think, looking at for high volume TURBT doctors between like 2016 and 2019. So I think this is sort of related to the Blue Light Registry. And they asked doctors, do you think it was like a little helpful, moderately helpful, extremely helpful or critical? And for physicians who didn't do a lot of TURs, like that didn't change much over time. But for physicians who did a ton of TURs, it went from the beginning about 10 percent of doctors said it was critical to at the end, like 33 percent said it was critical to their TUR. So I think what that spoke to to me was just, you know, you start to rely on like a whole nother set of cues. And it might not be that this lesion's like only blue light positive, but you start realizing like all these other small things that it's helping you do a little bit better. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Since I had my son, paying down my med school debt has become my top priority. I remember holding him in my arms for the first time, looking into his beautiful little face and just wanting the best future for him. With the Laurel Road Student Loan Cashback Card, my regular purchases earn me 2% cashback when I use it to pay down my student loans, which helps me reach my goals faster and plan for my family's future. Laurel Road for Doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor checking for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank NA member FDIC. Now, back to the show. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Ann Shuckman from University of Southern California, where she is an associate professor. Welcome to the show, Ann. How's it going today? Great. Thanks so much for having me, Aditya. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak a little bit about blue light, and I feel like people maybe fall into two categories where this is new, intimidating, unfamiliar technology that they don't want to dip a toe into, or they're, they're pretty facile with it. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we can get some content out for the full spectrum of listeners. And maybe just to start out, tell me just a little bit about, you know, what is this technology? If, you, if you're going to give it like your kind of two minute elevator speech. Yeah. So I guess the way I describe it to patients generally is that what blue light cystoscopy is, is a tool to try to help us find more tumors in patients' bladders at the time when we do TURBT. And essentially, it's just a dye that we put in people's bladders that's taken up preferentially by tumor cells. And when we look in with the white light, we may or may not see a tumor. And when we look in with the blue light wavelength, those tumor cells that have picked up the dye may glow pink. Perfect. So an enhanced vision technology. And it's been around for quite a while. I feel like it kind of has gained popularity or interest over the last four or five years, but actually 15, 16 years is, is my understanding. Is that right? Yeah. It's, I was actually looking that up when I was preparing for our discussion today. So Hexfix has been around in Europe since 2005. So we're really almost coming up to like the 20th anniversary of this. In the U.S., CISVIEW was approved in 2010. So we're a good 13 years into use by many providers in the States. Right, and absolutely. The group at USC, I think, has been on the front end of a lot of the clinical studies, early experience, and maybe just kind of jumping into it. For me, simplistically, when I think about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, the two outcomes of interest are recurrence and progression. And then, you know, of course, when it comes to muscle invasive bladder cancer, keeping people alive and not recurring. So do you just have like a ballpark number in your head from, you know, when you're talking to patients or meta-analyses, what is the impact on recurrence all comers? And we'll get into the, maybe the details a bit more. Yeah. So, I mean, overall, we know that we pick up about 20% of tumors with blue light that we don't find with white light. And so the way I think about it is if we don't find them with white light, those people are essentially bound to recur. And so I think that we can decrease that recurrence risk you know, probably by about 15 to 20 percent with blue light cystoscopy. Progression's a little bit trickier, and that data has been all over the map with blue light cystoscopy. So I don't tell patients, actually, that we will 
necessarily impact progression of disease, although there are several meta-analyses that suggest that we do. That's my interpretation as well. I know there's a study in bladder cancer looking at progression rates and it approached significance, but I'm a little reluctant to jump into, we may actually impact your ability to not progress. And and I've kind of actually, even over the course of my relatively short time as an attending, I've come to appreciate the impact of decreasing recurrences. When I started out, I say recurrences are inconvenient, progression events are dangerous, but I kind of feel like every trip to the OR in an older population, an infirm population is always, there's a risk, there's the anesthetic, there's the whole to-do of it. So my interpretation, you know, 15 to 20% decreased number of trips to the OR is absolutely worthwhile. How do you kind of see this? Yeah, I think that's the way I approach it. So I think with blue light cystoscopy, if we think about all of these patients who just have repetitive anesthesias, repetitive resections, which you know may or may not show cancer, but at the same time lead to impacts of scarring in their bladder and potential bladder dysfunction over time, you know, the less times that we're feeling the need to complete a biopsy of someone's bladder, potentially, I think that's important. So I think that's one aspect that's really helpful. I also think just the sort of psychological impact of recurrent disease is hard on patients. And so if we can limit the number of times that we're having to tell them that their cancer is back, I think that there is a huge impact of that for patients. I also think if we can do a better resection the first time and not necessarily have to do another resection, we can avoid some of the morbidity of up-classifying patients as somebody who recurred and now might get intravesical disease as opposed to just being managed with surveillance cystoscopy. Excellent points, all of those. And when when you think about more complete resections, I know this hasn't really been a focus of blue light technology, but do you have any opinions on the role of blue light for invasive disease? Like, i.e., are we able to potentially get a more complete TUR that's going to contribute to them ultimately being, say, pathological T0 at cystectomy? Or are we able to, you know, really clear them out in a, in a big way prior to chemo radiation? Yeah, that's a great question that I we have not looked at. You know, I think that if somebody has what appears to be a, you know, a large T2 tumor at the time of resection, that's actually a time when blue light isn't necessarily indicated. So if we're doing, you know, a cystoscopy in the office, you see a big tumor, you're probably not going to book that patient for a blue light. That wouldn't be the target population. We did just look at the data, looking at patients undergoing re-resection for high-grade TA and patients with high-grade T1 who initially had white light cystoscopy versus blue light cystoscopy. And so this is getting a little bit to your point. Looking at the patients with high-grade T1 who underwent re-TUR there actually wasn't a huge difference in the rate of persistent disease at the time of re-TUR in patients who had white light and blue light who had high-grade T1 up front. That number did kind of approach significance, so we probably are doing a little bit better job, but it wasn't significant in the database. Where it really is significant across multiple studies is looking at the rates of carcinoma in situ. And so as a clinician, I think this is really where blue light has the potential to shine kind of in in multiple ways. One, in upfront to you are in terms of kind of getting your staging right up front. Two, in follow-ups, you know, three, even after intravesical therapy, which are all places that are really hard and where carcinoma in situ presents such a challenge. Yeah, that's interesting data. And you know, I'd be kind of curious to see how many of those patients were initially resected at USC, for instance, or at high volume academic centers than the community, because I like, I'm sure you've got so many patients that had a complete TUR somewhere else and they come in to see you and their blood is chock full of tumor. Right. Absolutely. So I think that's a little bit hard to parse just in the raw numbers with that. Well, maybe we just dive on into it. So patients with gross hematuria, CT scan, there's something in the bladder. Are you going to look into their bladder in the clinic prior to going to the OR? Or are you typically, that's pretty suspicious for a tumor. Let's go straight to the OR, save you a little mini invasive procedure. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm kind of traditional in that way. I definitely still want to look in the patient's bladder in the clinic. And I think actually there's a couple good reasons for that in my mind. One is that I always tell patients, you know, I kind of want to know what I'm getting myself into in the operating room. I want to know if there's tumor near the ureteral orifice. I want to know if I need to like 
book a sea arm for that day or consider a stent. I also think it just helps in counseling the patient right there from that very first day as far as kind of the road you see them going down and what their prognosis might be. So I definitely scope people in the clinic before taking them to the OR. And that's a white light cyst. And, and I will say that's a white light cystoscopy because we haven't even really talked about like blue light flex in the clinic, you know, so that's a whole nother topic. Hopefully we can have a chance to talk about. Totally. Oh, yeah. It's on it's on the to do list. All right. So you get a look, you get a lay of the land, make sure it's not just something super offensive. And I suppose if it's, you know, an elder, infirm patients, comorbidities, all that, and there's something small, solitary, I generally don't do like a diagnostic initial procedure in the clinic, but I could maybe consider it, maybe consider it in a highest select one end of the bell curve patient. So they're going to the OR and, you know, generally it sounds like if it's some whopping tumor, clearly muscle invasive, maybe the role of blue light is somewhat limited. But apart from that, how are you kind of deciding who gets it or does everybody get it? Yeah, so pretty much at USC, or at least in my practice, everybody gets blue light. And there are a couple of reasons for that, honestly. One is, you know, maybe scientific. As we mentioned, I think that picking up the carcinoma in situ is really helpful. So, you know, you may see that papillary tumor in the clinic, but we know that we pick up about 20% more tumors with blue light, many, many of which are carcinoma in situ, which just has such a huge impact on prognostic information for the patient. So that's one reason. The more practical reason is that changing the workflow for each patient is really hard on our system. You know, so not only the residents, but for the nursing staff, et cetera, I think it's actually a lot easier if we just are most of the time doing blue light. So I would say, you know, 80 to 90 percent of my TURs are blue light, probably 90 percent with a small percentage where that's not what's going to happen that day. Yeah, I agree. I think just kind of doing it, making it part of your workflow. We'll talk about de novo and recurrent and surveillance, et cetera. But I feel like it's rarely uncomfortable for the patients. I think they generally prefer it. I have patients left and right that ask for it. Well, yeah, you know, and, and actually, you know, uh, they did that patient reported outcome study looking at blue light. And they found out that about 95% of patients who had had a blue light once were requesting it going forward. So I don't think that little nuisance, and this is Angie Smith did this study, um, you know, so I don't think that the issue of having a catheter in or having the CISVU instilled was considered too burdensome for patients. And I think that generally, even just, a, you know, patients talking to me, it's, it's the sense that, man, if you even have like a 5% chance of doing a better job in there, and I'm not really going to have any downside to that, you know, why wouldn't we use that technology? Sort of, you know, why wouldn't you be as unblindfolded as possible when you're doing my surgery? Fair. Yeah, I think the downside is extremely small and they're getting a catheter and, you know, somewhere in the next hour or two, they're either going to get a rigid cystoscope or a flexible <laughs> cystoscope. So, you know, exactly. in, that, in that sense, it's not that much worse. No. All right. So let's just say you don't have blue light at your particular institution and this is something that you're interested in. So maybe I'll give you my like ultra simplified iteration so there's a, there's a medication, CISVU, and that's got to go into the bladder for, what, about an hour to three hours of dwell time? 30 minutes to an hour, minimum. Right. And practically, I mean, for the OR, it's a no-brainer. They're coming in a couple hours early for pre-op. And I would just make sure it's ordered, get it in. And even if we go back, by the time they get anesthesia-induced, position, so forth, it's, you're pretty much kind of there. Absolutely. All right. So there's a medication, that's CISVU. And then there's the equipment, maybe the equipment and some quotation marks here. So let's just like break it down. What is this like specialized equipment that's required to actually make it happen? Yeah. So, so I actually went through this process at LA County Hospital of kind of trying to convince the system there as you, as they will, to adopt blue light. So, you know, so the medication is, is easy. That's going through pharmacy at most institutions. And the equipment is really a cystoscope and a resectoscope, you know, just like anything we're all used to using. For better or worse, the approval, the FDA approval for CISVU is tied to Carl Stortz equipment at this point in the U.S. And so you've got to have a Stortz tower and you've got to have a Stortz blue light cystoscope. And there's no other companies that make compatible equipment at this point. 
But as far as the urologist sort of end user experience, the Carl Stortz resectoscope is exactly like any resectoscope that we've all used for our whole career. It's just like any resectoscope, you know, has a white light mode that's just like a normal scope. And then you just flip the button into the blue light mode and, you know, you're able to toggle back and forth as you work. It's not something that you need any nursing assistance to do. It's just right there in your hand um, and very easy. And, you know, my understanding of the cost of a system, if that's something we want to get into at all, is I think it's a between like eighty to dollars to $100,000 investment for an institution. Yeah. And so we're actually, thankfully, got it approved here at UC San Diego, which I'm excited about, both flexible and rigid sets at our two major flagship hospitals. So we, I've also kind of gone through it. And at the end of the day, it's not rocket science. And I, I would imagine that Certainly people in private practice are more facile and adept with this process of getting equipment than typically academicians are. But it's, you know, it's a proprietary light box that's going to give you the wavelength, et cetera, to kind of give you the right thing. Then you've got your image generator. And at the end of the day, you can use a tower that already exists in the OR. Or you can buy a Carl Stortz tower. There's the kind of bells and whistles, if you will. You know, you can have like a bare bones resectoscope set, or you can get a bit more and it lands right in that 80 to $120,000 range with some discounts. If you bundle it, get a couple of sets. And I do think it's probably not a bad idea to have a couple of sets just in case one malfunctions or things along those lines. Yeah, we've had all kinds of issues, you know, over the years. We find that the cords are the biggest problem that we have. <laughs> and so I recommend always having several cords in the room at any time when you're doing one of these cases. But yeah, I mean, I think that for the nursing staff in the OR, one of the things that's nice is that the setup is really similar to what they're used to. There's really nothing special. This is with the rigid. You know, the, the flex in the clinic, again, is a little different than what we're used to as a, with the flexible cystoscope. But it's not dramatically different to the point where people would need retraining. Yeah, great. So the, so the medication's safe. It's almost like an inert substance. And we can talk about this in the clinic setting. But many times, if I have any inkling that I might be doing a bladder biopsy fluoridation in the clinic, I'll oftentimes just put in some lidocaine along with it. I don't know if you guys do that, but it kind of, you know, you're sticking a catheter in as is, letting something dwell for an hour. There's no real interactions between the two and if you've got to do a biopsy. And yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, we, we don't do that, but I think I'm going to start doing that. Totally. I mean, and we can also talk about this. It's not a blue light phenomenon necessarily, but I have found that my office biopsy rate has really increased mostly because I'm seeing a lot more stuff. I don't want to take the people back to the OR for a false positive and I'll just biopsy, put it to rest right then between the cytology and a little biopsy. I know if this is inflammation, post-BCG changes, CIS, et cetera. But for the purpose of the OR, we've put in our medication. The patient's allowed it to dwell for minimum 30 minutes or so. Now, pretend I'm your PGY2 or 3, and this is my first day with you in the OR. We're doing our blue light case. Kind of walk me through your educational spiel. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of sort of potential pitfalls with the blue light. And I think there are some tricks that are helpful. So the first one is when you first put in your scope, I think it's pretty important to spend some time, however you want to do it, sort of washing the cis view out of the bladder. And you also have to be pretty careful that when you're putting in the scope, you don't get a lot of bleeding from the bladder, neck and prostate. So the reasons for that are if you have a lot of cyst view in the bladder, a lot of urine in the bladder, everything's just going to kind of look green when you look in the bladder. And you're not going to see that nice definition. Really, you're not going to see much at all. White light will look normal. But on when you flip into blue light mode, you'll just see a lot of green urine. So the more you can irrigate that out, wash that out, try to get the urine out, the better the discrimination between normal tissue and really pink tumors will be. And I always tell the juniors that it's like the trick, like you let them do the whole case. Then at the end, when everything's washed out, the attending takes over and the visualization's perfect. So that's one of the tricks. Second is the blood in, in the bladder. So if you have a patient who's really bloody, in general, blue light and cystic is just like not going to be that helpful. So whether it's a radiation cystitis patient where like you distend their bladder and they're just bleeding everywhere or somebody where, you, you know, you get a lot of bleeding right up front from the prostate or even from a tumor, the blood just makes everything look really dark with cis views. So it kind of limits the contrast between, you know, like the normal and the pink. So just taking the time, I think, to really like make sure your bladder is pretty clear 
is helpful. Then the third thing that I like to do is really right at the beginning before you get too crazy with resecting, I like to make sure that I do like a full white light cystoscopy and a full blue light cystoscopy. And that's mostly because of the bleeding. You know, once you start mucking around a lot, then your visualization may be limited. And so I'd like to kind of say, okay, that's where I note the blue light positive lesions to be, kind of toggle back and forth with white light and make my like mental map of the bladder. So I know where I want to biopsy. Sometimes you can slough off like some of the urethelium with the, you know, irrigating out tumor or whatnot. And so I like to kind of decide up front what I think might be blue light positive and not white light positive in particular. Yeah, that's super helpful. One of the things that I think many times is a bit hard to sort out is the impact of tangentially looking at a tumor. Like the trigon always looks pink and it always you know, it's hard to say, is this tumor or not? And, you know, when you look at the lateral walls of the first go, there's always some tangential or, or certainly they've got cellules and diverticula, the perimeters of those will many times light up. Any kind of techniques and maneuvers to minimize that or help interpret that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of things. One, just experience. So, I mean, everyone I've ever talked to who does a lot of blue light says, just like anything, you get better at it over time. You know, like you really do learn to recognize like, okay, that's real. That's not real. You know, you mentioned like the bladder neck and trying to figure out that tangential view. So I think time is one. But two is if you see a lesion, it's really helpful to almost scan across it, scan back over it and really look at where the pink or the blue light positive area is and see if that area is like a stable edge as you move or whether as you move is the whole pink moving with you because you're just kind of moving your tangential view. So I think that can be really helpful, especially when you're looking at something near the bladder neck. Yeah, I think that's a great technical point. And I also think you mentioned earlier, you know, CIS is really a major opportunity for us to improve but I'm convinced that some of those kind of peritumoral early dysplastic changes that are, you know, somewhere in their dysplasia, atypia journey to becoming a tumor, and it may very well be a low-grade tumor, those, I feel like you can visualize them. Now, whether that's because the tumor is slightly raised and it's a more of a geometry thing, do you have any thoughts on that, Anne? Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like I've maybe changed my view on that using CISVIEW a lot because you toggle back and forth all the time. So I think that it's hindsight's twenty twenty with everything. So if you're looking at something and you're like, oh, that's blue light positive, and then you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, well, I actually kind of can see that with the white light. So it makes you a better cystoscopist in general, I think. And then I think that if you're resecting under blue light, which you know, we do do, I think you can really see a difference in the way the tissue resets, if it's tumor or not tumor, or, you know, that sort of fluffy, what you're talking about, like early, maybe they're going to call it early TA, or you resect it and you know, looking at that, that it's not resecting like normal bladder, but you might not have actually appreciated that with just a cold cup or something along those lines. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point that early on, it's probably not a bad idea to send biopsies off as, you know, blue light positive only or blue light positive, just to kind of see how this goes in your own hand. Yeah. I mean, clearly you and I have drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. I've definitely <laughs> heard people that are like, come on, I don't believe it. If you really look closely, this, that, and the other. So if you either have it or are going to invest in it, it's probably just like anything worthwhile to track your data and, and see how it actually goes. Yeah. You know, I came across this really interesting survey that they did out of Minnesota, um, it was Kennedy's group, I think, looking at for high volume TURBT doctors between like 2016 and 2019. So I think this is sort of related to the blue light registry. And they asked doctors, do you think it was like a little helpful, moderately helpful, extremely helpful or critical? And for patients who, I mean, for physicians who didn't do a lot of TURs, like that didn't change much over time. But for physicians who did a ton of TURs, it went from the beginning about 10% of doctors said it was critical to at the end, like 33% said it was critical to their TUR. So I think what that spoke to to me was just, you know, you start to rely on like a whole nother set of cues. And it might not be that this lesion's like only blue light positive, but you start realizing like all these other small things that it's helping you do a little bit better. Yeah. And the point about becoming a better white light endoscopist, I think is, is well taken. 
and the studies were cleverly designed so that you really couldn't do like your absolute best, best, best white light. Right. <laughs> well, there's that. Relying on the fact that you're going to have blue light to kind of bail you out. All right. So, I mean, I think that kind of at least walks us through the journey somewhat practically. It's not like, I don't know, compare it to like, if you want to like start getting into like MRI, ultrasound, fusion, transperineal biopsies. I think that's like a whole nother skill set. The way I think about this, this is absolutely well within any core urologist skill set to do a TUR. And really at the end of the day, it's, it's pressing a button, like you said, toggling from white light to blue light, getting familiar with the new views, the new colors, and getting on with it. Yeah. And it doesn't actually take any of your white light tools out of your hands. Totally. Yeah. You know, it's just like an adjunct. And, and I will say this, I'll, I'm sure somebody's going to be unhappy. I do feel like the Carl Storch resectoscope set is not necessarily my favorite, <laughs> but the pictures are amazing. Like it's actually assembling it and dismantling it every time I'm like, Ugh. but when you actually put it together and take a look, and especially for the flexibles, I feel like that's as good as it gets for any type of flexible oscilloscope that I've seen. All right. So for the rigid side, we've talked about the mechanics and still the medication, get them to the OR, do the case. And generally for de novo patients so far, who do you use blue light rigid OR TURs for in terms of patients that have recurrent disease? Yeah. So similarly, I'll be honest, we tend to just use it all the time because again, that whole workflow issue and there's not a ton of downside, but the patients where I'm really like, think it's the most helpful are the patients who had carcinoma in situ at their initial presentation. So, you know, whether, well, I mean, they pretty much have all gotten intravesical therapy at that point. So, you know, the post intravesical therapy, patients who had CIS, I think that's where it's really, really helpful and gives me a lot of, you know, confidence. So do, are you a complete CIS resector or fulgurator or uh, do you leave it in as a marker lesion relying on your intravesical therapy? I try to resect all of it. You know, I mean, I don't see any reason to leave it in there unless somebody's on a study. But I, I think the more important question is, are you somebody who always rebiopsies after initial induction BCG? You know, and I am. So if somebody had CIS up front, I'm always going to rebiopsy them after that induction BCG. And I know, you know, not everybody does. Some people might just do an office cysto, but I do like to do that. And I do like to do that with blue light. And I will say this is an area where the blue flex actually maybe could change my opinion about taking those patients back to the OR. Because this is actually, I think, where the blue flex in the office is great is after that initial induction BCG, I can still feel good about doing my biopsy but potentially save these patients, you know, an anesthetic. Totally. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. And there's some, you know, relatively less common scenarios, like say it's like a larger TA high grade, no muscle sampled, despite the fact that that's 99% the pathologist's fault. If I was the one who did that, <laughs> and if I did that with like blue light, I would be okay omitting like a, a second look restaging TUR. I mean, if it's a T1 high grade, in my practice, they're pretty much going back, you know, muscle or not for another go at it. But I, I think, again, when you're doing a, a second look, you know, six, eight weeks out or whatever your, your typical cadence is, there's always a little rim of erythema that's blue light positive, fairly pink. But I am somewhat surprised at the additional tumors that I'll pick up. Yeah. So I'm curious and I'll ask you, I mean, I don't find in those settings that the primary tumor that I'm going back to re-resect is usually not going to be blue light positive because it's all necrotic. You know, it's not really like taking up the cyst view. You're right. Like maybe if there was really an incomplete resection on the edges, you'll see something. But I think even in that setting, it's like picking up the additional tumors or the carcinoma in situ is really helpful. Totally. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever gone and seen like additional pink within the base that it's like there's something deeper that I need to get. Yeah. I think it's just like too dead at that place to help. It's mostly carcinoma in situ. I mean, the papillary stuff, I feel like you're pretty much able to handle that. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you're thinking about starting up a blue light program at your hospital. My understanding is the hospitals will oftentimes at least foot part of the bill. Is that fair? Yeah, I would I would guess so. I mean, I, I obviously I'm sure that I can't speak to that. I think it's very variable, but I can say that it'll be interesting to see in the next 
10 years because all of our residents in these major academic centers are being trained with blue light now. Not all, but many, many. And so they are very facile, very confident. And I think that they they actually probably fall into like this survey I was talking about before where they almost feel like naked without their blue light. So I see them going out into practice and trying to negotiate that as one of their parts of their startup package. So I find that interesting. Yeah. I mean, the thought of like doing a prostatectomy without an MRI, like kind of is extremely off-putting to me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, clearly yeah. there's a generation ahead of us that just kind of relied on the, the sidedness of the biopsies and they kind of made their operative plan based on that. And what about reimbursement? Are you going to get paid more if you use blue light? Is there anything that, that kind of gets lumped into that? So that probably depends where you're doing your surgery. I think if you're doing your surgery in an actual freestanding like surgery center, you can bill for the CISVIEW installation and there's reimbursement codes where you'll get paid a little bit more for doing a blue light cystoscopy. If you're in like a hospital-based OR, I don't think you really do get reimbursed much more for that. And in the clinic, in the outpatient setting, my understanding is that you can get reimbursed, but that the reimbursement is mostly if you actually do a biopsy when you're doing the flex blue light. So there is a little like incentive to do a biopsy when you're doing the flex blue light if you're in clinic. Yeah, and we didn't talk too much about it on the front end, but ostensibly that's not going to be a decision driven by more money in my pocket, but false positives and, and trips to the OR. So what's the kind of number that you have with respect to that? I mean, so we have this enhanced technology, which is picking up more tumors. And presumably, if we're going to be identifying some things that actually aren't cancers, false positives. Yeah. So everyone, you know, we're always really worried that we're going to have a much higher false positive rate with the blue light. But that really hasn't panned out. Even in the post BCG type setting, the rates are really comparable between white light and blue light. So probably somewhere between five and 10 percent false positive rate which is, it's not really been shown to be higher in the blue light group, which is surprising. Right. And I actually think that's exactly where the beauty of blue light flexible cysto is, is you can make a diagnosis. Like I mentioned, we oftentimes will put light again in at the time of installation. And you basically get your answer at the point of care within 48 hours once you've, once you've got your biopsy back. So let's talk a little bit about that. Flexible without totally reinventing the wheel. The technology is basically the same. The workflow can be a little bit more cumbersome, I think, to the clinic side of things. Can you just maybe talk through things that have worked and have not worked for you all at USC? Yeah. So things that work are, I think, having, you know, designated people in your clinic who are the CISVIEW people. So somebody can troubleshoot the equipment as that comes up. Two, you can't really put somebody in your cysto room and then put a catheter in and have them staying in there for an hour while the cyst is in their bladder. So, you know, we instill the cyst view and then patients generally can wait in the waiting area during that dwell time. I mean, if there's a spare exam room or something, that's an option as well. But, you know, you just want to figure out how to make sure you're not monopolizing all of your workspace. Things that are challenging, you know, we've had some challenges from the equipment side, dealing with the suction setup that is required with the flexible scope. And <laughs> I see you're nodding your head there. So, you know, with, with the flexible scope, you're, there, if, what's different? So if, if you haven't ever used a flexible scope, you know, there's the inflow like we're all used to on a flexible scope, but then there's suction tubing that's attached and it'll help you to fill the bladder and empty the bladder. And the reason to empty the bladder is, again, to get all that urine out so you're not just looking at green urine when you're doing your flexible scope. And I have had, I think maybe I'm just bad at using this, but I have had so many problems with this tubing and with the pump. But there is an out to it. So if you do have problems with that, you can always just irrigate the same as you would normally irrigate for a cytology and empty the patient's bladder without using the pump that's associated with the scope. So all is not lost if this malfunctions in the, in the middle of your procedure. But that can be a, a little bit tricky to troubleshoot. Otherwise, I think it's very, very straightforward. I mean, it's sort of what we're all used to with a working port. You can biopsy just the same. Yeah. And actually, once you kind of get it figured out, 
the suction is kind of amazing. You know, if somebody's got a little bit of hematuria or like whatever, it's like, why didn't somebody think about this a decade ago? Because you can just empty right out. Or, you know, if it's an older patient and you want to leave them super distended, it's a nice way to just decompress prior to completing. Yeah, you can get like the air bubble out of the bladder with the suction, which is kind of cool if you need to do a biopsy up in that area. Absolutely. And the other thing that, you know, it just took us a little bit of figuring out so the cyst view comes as like a powder with, I can't remember if it's saline or water that you have to reconstitute it yeah. in saline. So if, if you have like the certification to do that in your clinic versus by like a pharmacist, that kind of saves you a little bit of a headache and another level of coordinating. Right. Yeah, that's true. And we, we do do that in our clinic and it's very easy to do. As you know, it's just injecting a bunch of saline into a, a vial, essentially. There's no nothing tricky. It doesn't need a hood or anything special, but just knowing how to do it. Yeah. The, the final thing that maybe in our experience was that sometimes the message for patients to come in an hour and a half early was a little bit lost. And actually what we started transitioning to is a 20 minute nursing visit an hour and a half before their Cisto. So it's scheduled on my chart because many times this stuff is not on my chart and people kind of live and die by that these days. So just kind of a, a practical thing that, that seems to have worked reasonably well. Yeah. And we do, I mean, we do book patients for like a two hour window in the clinic on the day when they're doing a blue light. You know, they are in clinic for a while. Yeah. That, that'd be the other part. If there's scopes at two o'clock, just bring them at 1230 and, you know, get on with it. Yeah. And I guess on the super practical side, I do think you absolutely need to have at least two scopes as well. If you want to have any sort of a blue light flexible program in your office. A, absolutely. B, I think if you're thinking about getting another scope, it's not like a blue light scope is limited to blue light. You can do cysto stent pulls or whatever else, you know, cysto Botox. I don't know if that requires, I don't do those, a special type of scope, but I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. And then who are you doing blue light flexible cysto? So you mentioned the post BC induction BCG patients, and then is it almost all comers or, or who's it going to be? Yeah. So it's definitely not all comers, you know, as opposed to the OR where it's all comers. I really try to be more selective in clinic just because of the kind of workflow issues that we've discussed. It's too much time to just be doing every surveillance system that way, at least for me. So I try to use it in patients who have intermediate risk disease, you know, where they, these patients who just have like the recurrent low grade tumors where kind of periodically will biopsy and full grade in clinic, you know, so I'll talk about it with them and we'll say, okay, like next time let's do a blue light. We're going to plan on that visit. We're going to like take care of all of this stuff. So that's a perfect patient, I think, for, for blue light to try to really get everything out at that one visit. And then I, I definitely like it for patients who have had, again, any time in the first two years after carcinoma in situ, I really like to use blue light. So those high risk patients, you know, whether or not they're after BCG or some other agent. I don't know of any other intravesical agent that, you know, is contraindicated. So those high-risk patients, I try to do it for the first two years. Yeah, I think the low-risk patients agree. You know, it, it's maybe not a lot of value added. The intermediate-risk patients, especially the multifocal low-grade, especially in the older patients, I think it's a really, really nice option to, to really clean them out very, very well. And I can't take credit for this, but one of the things that one of my friends and partners, Yair Lotan, would do is actually when consenting them for cysto and possible biopsy, impossible fulguration, and possible intravesical therapy. So we would have gemcitabine ready to go. And if you, you know, if there's a couple of small solitary tumors, then at, at the same setting, just go ahead and instill some gemcitabine. And now they've really gotten a fairly comprehensive enhanced cysto plus gemcitabine to, to minimize their chance of going back to the OR. Yeah, that's incredible. I think that the, you know, the high risk patients, I, I kind of like it. I have, you know, we're set up to do a biopsy right there at, at the point of care. And if they end up being like a rapidly recurrent low risk patient, which actually transitions them into intermediate risk mode, it can work pretty well. Excellent. So how do you kind of interpret blue light findings in the context of a cytology? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that kind of dovetails with the question of, like, if you have a negative blue light, do you need to take biopsies? Which I think are sort of related questions. So the first thing is negative cytology, positive blue light, I, I would definitely 
trust my blue light more than my cytology. I tend to think it's, you know, more specific and probably more sensitive. So I, I would trust my visual interpretation more. Then the flip side of that, you know, so one of the, obviously one of the big indications for blue light is those patients with a positive cytology and nothing on white light cystoscopy. So that was sort of one of the really early kind of indications for blue light where you can, you know, often pick up those extra tumors and you're really limited. Like you can't use blue light down in the prostatic urethra, you know, some of those other things. Yeah, I think that answers the question. I feel like most people that take care of bladder cancer patients that have a positive cytology and a negative white light cysto still pretty much believe that the bulk of those patients have something going on in the bladder. I'm not a big ureteral cat selective cytology person. I do think that once you've kind of effectively ruled out the bladder with blue light and with the upper tracts with like a good high quality CTU or an MRU, the prosthetic urethra can be a nidus for tumor cells that are camped out. But once the bladder is kind of been cleared with blue light, I don't really feel compelled to do random bladder biopsies, for instance. Yeah, I think that that's probably, so in somebody who had a negative cytology, who I was doing a surveillance and they have a negative blue light, I definitely would not do random bladder biopsies. For somebody who had a positive cytology and a equivocal blue light or what I could have convinced myself, I would still do biopsies and I'd try to be as unrandom as possible. And but I still would biopsy in that situation. <laughs> totally. Yeah. No, just to be clear, if it's like a stone cold, normal blue light cysto, then I don't know that a biopsy is mandatory. But if there's anything, even if it's the trigone, and I kind of feel like it's probably tangential, those are ones that are still going to get my attention and get a biopsy. And generally the bulk of the time that's going to be in the clinic. Yeah, but I agree. I think a negative blue light is really pretty sensitive for ruling out something significant going on. I mean, a true blue light negative positive cancer biopsy has been exceptionally rare in, you know, all of the registries that have looked at blue light data. Yeah. And I think, you know, as things continue to progress between enhanced imaging, between maybe some newer, exciting bladder markers, you know, potential will get to a point where we can really save the trips to the OR for high yield trips where patients really, really kind of need it. So let's just say I've only got about 120K sitting around and not 250K. And I've got to decide I want flex or, or rigid. Oh, yeah. Where, where would you start out? I'd start with rigid. I, you know, I think that getting your sort of comfort and facility with the technology with the patient asleep is always a little bit easier. I think that actually the flex can be somewhat trickier with the tangential views and you're flipping backwards. And I think until you kind of learn what blue light positive lesions look like, you probably interpret your initial flexes with a lot more false sort of false positive, you know, interpretation. Well, th this is fantastic, Anne, and I've certainly learned plenty. You know, I feel like if I wanted to start a blue light program, I'd at least have the nuts and bolts down pretty well to do that. Anything else that you'd like to share with the listenership? Any topics that, that we didn't touch on in, in the course of our conversation? Well, I think that the takeaway message, you know, for me with blue light again, is just that there's really no downside. I think, you know, from a patient perspective, from a user perspective, it's really easy. And it's, if you have access to it, I, I think it's a no brainer, again, just to sort of use all the tools at, at your disposal. Perfect. Thanks for that, Anne. And, you know, again, I, I would venture to say between you all and a couple of other centers, you've probably got the largest experience in the US. So a lot, a lot of great input from you all. Thanks for spending the time. You know, we'll have to have you come back on to talk about any other number of things that you're an expert at. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. This has been really fun. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Vedavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.